Hi, good afternoon um, and welcome to the fourth call of the National Action Alliance summer webinar series, engaging boards and executive leadership in safety. Today's call is being sponsored by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. We would like very much for this to be an interactive session and at different points in time may be requesting to hear from you. Please feel free to use the chat function or raise your hand to have your line opened up to provide a comment. As a reminder, Today's call is being recorded and slides will be made available to participants after the call. Dr. Klein, the floor is yours. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, to those of you on the West Coast, uh, good morning. Uh, welcome to uh, the fourth in our series of patient safety uh, webinars. Uh, we have a wonderful speaker today, uh, Beth Daly Ulam, who will speak about engaging boards and executive leadership in safety. Uh, I, am, I, I am the Chief Medical Officer for the Quality Measurement and Value-Based Incentives Group, Center for Clinical Standards and Quality, CMS, uh, and uh, our work here with our, our federal partners, our HHS partners, is a commitment to uh, CMS's uh, belief in the value uh, and importance of safety, uh, and also the importance we place on having effective governance uh, to, to bring safety uh, to patients. Uh, next slide, please. And as I was starting to say, this is a joint initiative of uh, four uh, HHS uh, agencies, uh, AHRQ, CDC, CMS, and FDA. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and uh, this is at the initiative of Secretary Becerra from November of 2022, who wanted all of us to recommit to advancing patient and workforce safety. It's a public-private collaboration. It's a voluntary learning community. Uh, we're, we're, we're working with stakeholders and uh, it's a recognition that healthcare is not safe until it's safe for all. Uh, next slide, please. And there are four pillars of the National Action Plan. I will encourage you to find uh, the Safer Together report on the AHRQ, excuse me, on the IHI website. Um, and it builds on four different uh, pillars, uh, culture, leadership and governance, patient and family engagement, workforce safety, and the creation of the learning health systems. Next slide. Uh, we have another upcoming webinar on September 26th, uh, which is uh, for the Veterans Health Administration, and uh, two more webinars in October and November uh, that are not yet uh, uh, identified, but they will they will occur. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so this is a national action time frame, uh, a national action alliance time frame. Uh, we are, are sponsoring these uh, these webinars, which sort of a learning and listening uh, session. Uh, on November 16th, the National Advisory uh, Commission uh, Committee will meet, uh, and hopefully by next winter, we'll have a National Action Alliance uh, to launch uh, some, some uh, definite measures towards patient safety. Uh, next slide, please. And I would be, I would be remiss uh, if I didn't make people aware uh, that the importance of patient safety comes from the White House. Uh, there's a President's Council on Advisors on Science and Technology, we lovingly referred to as PCAST, uh, and they're in the process of uh, 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 publishing a report on uh, the uh, importance of uh, patient safety, uh, and recently had a, uh, a public listening session and discussion that uh, you can uh, find on YouTube. Uh, next slide, please. So with that, it's going to be it's my pleasure and honor to introduce our speaker today, Beth Daly Ulam, uh, and she. Uh, I, I would say I'll start at the beginning here. Um, one of the things that have struck me as I've listened to patient safety advocates, uh, as an unfortunate uh, thing to to be struck by, is that everyone brings a terrible story to to their work here. That they've all been affected either personally or their family members, and that's inspired them to work on patient safety. And I think that that's a that's a tremendously powerful uh, uh, story, uh, and Beth has her own story that she may or may not share with you. Uh, she's tur turned that tragedy uh, into, into something positive. Uh, she works on supporting and advising health systems on governance. She's been the lead author on, on, on a patient safety report on governance, co-founded Patient Safety US, uh, and serves on multiple current uh, boards. I won't go through all of that. Um, it's there on the slides. With that, I'll turn it over to Beth. And uh, after Beth is uh, done with her, her, her presentation, uh, we look forward to uh, interactive, uh, important conversation. With that, I turn it over to Beth. 
Thanks so much, Ron, and thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, really excited to talk to you about governance because I think it's a, a great opportunity for organizations to create momentum and support leadership all the way down to the front line on patient safety and quality. And without that, I, I think it's hard to have the, the focus, the resources and the commitment uh, unless your board is on board and committed to safety and quality. So excited to share with you some of the, the um, thoughts that I have and the work that I and others have done. Um, and also would love to really at the end have a pretty vibrant discussion with some of the challenges and approaches that you're taking to governance in your organizations um, to advance quality. So one thing I'd love to start with is some of these, these larger webinars um, it's, you know, everybody's coming at it from different perspectives. So if, for those of you that are comfortable, feel free, feel free to throw in the chat, um, your name and organization or just your organization, um, or, you know, any, any early thoughts you have that you're trying to struggle with, with boards so that we start to, to populate the chat with things that we want to talk about in our discussion and perspectives that we're, we're, we're joining today with, um, if we want to move forward. Great, so today I thought we would talk about three things and the chat's really helpful because there might be other things that are, are top of mind um, and, and we'll get to those in, in, um, in due time. So the first thing uh, really is kind of centering ourselves on the challenges that you all face in supporting your board's engagement on quality. Uh, the second piece is to clarify the workflow and attributes of a board committed to quality. What should they exactly do and, and where should the variance among what they're doing uh, exist? Uh, the third piece is, you know, trying to be very tactical today about what are some of the strategies and tools that you can access to support your board's oversight of quality or understanding of quality. And what are some of the strategies that you might think about using to accelerate your, your board's um, work on quality. So those are the three things we're, we're uh, intending to cover in addition to what you put in the chat uh, moving forward. So first I'd like to start with just a reflection question because I think it's important, you know, everybody here is coming at this from different perspectives and and I go into a lot of boardrooms and, and what what you see in one boardroom is not necessarily true for the challenges that you see in another boardroom. So it's it's really important to center on, you know, what what are the biggest challenges and, and where's your starting point? Um, so, you know, a lot of times I'll do this in a polling. It wasn't really possible with the WebEx, but but let's start with just a reflection perspective. You don't have to put in a chat, but just thinking about it from where you stand with your interaction with your board. Um, is your board one that proactively adds to the agenda areas of quality oversight or concern and is very interactive? Or is your board one that is reacting to what's presented to, to them, but they do try to engage on quality? Does your board primarily cover safety uh, or does it uh, rarely discuss clinical performance, population health, and other dimensions of quality? Is your board hospital centric? Does it evaluate quality in all the other areas that you provide care, such as your behavioral health, your nursing homes, your clinics? Is your board just flat out not interested in quality and it gets pushed to the consent agenda as something that's not their responsibility? Is your board uh, receiving an education in quality, but they're maybe not sure if what they're doing is best practice? Is your board one that understands harm, but doesn't really understand how to connect the dots between that discussion of harm and ensuring that it's resourced and supported in terms of quality and improvement and leadership prioritization. So you might have multiple of these going on, but I think it's really important just to say, what's the, what's the crux of our biggest challenge right now with our unique board? If we wanna move forward, so if we, if we go into today's objectives, let's start with the first one, which is what are the challenges to supporting your board on quality? Move forward, please. So let me back up a little um, from the perspective that, that I had on this is, you know, years ago, maybe 15 years ago, I was on two health system boards, Theta Care in Northeast Wisconsin, which um, uh, medium-sized system, and also the Children's Hospital of Wisconsin. 
And I called Tejal Gandhi, uh, who was then head of NPSF, and I said, our boards are doing entirely different things to oversee quality. Which one is right? Where's the guidance? Because I came from the for-profit world. Uh, I worked at McKinsey and did consulting for, for companies and was was frequently in the boardroom talking to boards. And every year the boards for, for um, more for-profit companies would be going to the National Association of Corporate Di Directors. And depending on what committee you were on, or if you're on the executive committee, you would get some guidance on here's exactly what you're supposed to do. And that just didn't exist in, in, um, in, in the area of, of health system board quality oversight. There was no consistent guidance. This is about uh, 12 years ago. And so, you know, really getting to the crux of the problem is, is how do we guide boards on what to do? There was huge variation on what boards were doing. And, and also the not all board members are coming to boards with an understanding of systems engineering, high, high reliability, and and other concepts that would translate into quality oversight. So there's just generally been a, an avoidance of quality by the board. So, you know, years ago when I reached out to Tejal, um, we kind of talked about the need for this guidance for boards. And many years later, IHI um, with the Lucian Leap Institute, uh, since National Patient Safety Foundation had merged into the Lucian, uh, into the IHI, the Lucian Leap Institute sponsored this work to sort of understand what's causing that variation and what should be the consistent guidance that we should be giving boards. And a lot of times the frustration for um, leadership was you would go to different governance conferences and it was frequently panels that would recommend one thing. And then if you send your board the next year, it might recommend a different thing. So trying to get to what we, what we try to have in quality in hospital systems of a standard of work where you're not seeing that variation in recommendations constantly was, was one thing that we thought the market needed. Um, and so it really sponsored this, this big body of work, you know, governance, in, in terms of what boards were doing, wasn't just variation and oversight and avoidance of quality, but really, you know, learning how to be proactive thought partners. It was very comfortable for boards to be proactive thought partners on margin or on philanthropy, but getting into the area of quality was something that you know they weren't sure how to be proactive about, especially when you're often bombarded with data from board meeting to board meeting. So, you know, some of these challenges kind of led us to this current state and how we get to a future state where we have a, a more consistent guidance for boards on what they should be doing and consistent guidance for those who support boards. Um, so I mentioned some of these others, the choppy data being shared with boards, the hospital centric nature of what boards were doing and really getting to this time issue that boards did not have enough time to really understand quality and understand what their role should be in engaging with the leadership on quality. So, you know, how do we move from the current state to the state of, of where we'd like to go if we wanna move forward? First, the first step in figuring out how to move forward is to figure out where your board stands and its challenges. And one of the things we, we thought about was this, you know, spectrum of what causes the variation and really looking at your board and looking at your board both collectively and, and sometimes individually um, in, in where they are on that spectrum causing the variation. You know, on the, the one side, you have boards that are just not motivated and the solution set that you would apply to get that board more engaged and motivated in quality is very different from if you have a board that's motivated, but they're not capable and not sure what to do. That board needs more, more training and uh, guidance on standard work. Whereas the first board that's not motivated or interested in quality needs more invitation and, and prioritization and, and early education. Um, so the solution set that you, you uh, choose to use to improve your board's commitment and support of quality depends on where your board is to begin with. So let's just dive a little bit deeper if we move forward on this. So if we if we talk about sort of internal variation um, in in terms of 
motivation and prioritization, you know, let's just call out what is one challenge in, in board engagement on quality, which is that many hospital CEOs or health system CEOs still prefer not to have the board engaged in quality and just have them do philanthropy. Um, they just, there's, there's still this issue that they don't want the board in involved in a capacity, any capacity in their operational business. And, and that is, has been increasingly, I would say less of a trend, but it still exists in some boards. Um, and in some some leadership circles, many boards, I think, you know, more more of what I see is that most many boards just tend to be a little overwhelmed by the the acronyms, the technical elements of quality that are just unfamiliar to them if they're not, you know, coming from a healthcare background. And since a lot of boards are community and civic leaders, you have lawyers, bankers, business people, you know, how do you get them up to speed enough on the, the sort of scope of technical concepts without miring them too far in the weeds of that, but just to be able to engage thoughtfully in improvement and, um, and commitment around these issues. Many boards also just, I think, struggle to understand that this is a strategic priority, that this is core to what we are exist as a health system to deliver um, you know, many boards just think of the financial margin um, as the, the more essential uh, component of their oversight and, and really don't think of this as a strategic priority. So, you know, reframing that for them is, is a really important thing. And that we have, we'll talk about some tools later on in, in um, the discussion today about how to do that. The second piece, if you want to move forward, is just the selection and succession. One way to to think about how to in better engage your board on quality is pick select board members who have high reliability backgrounds or when they join your health system spend you know significant time in educating them on quality and and the board's role in quality and a good example of that would be how you know Cincinnati Children's asks every new board member whether your experience is finance or your experience is legal to spend your first year on the board serving on the quality committee as a way to say this is our core of our operations um the the other challenge that I know all of you are are familiar with and struggle with is the the cycle of people coming on and off the board puts an enormous amount of pressure on the leadership team to re-educate, reintroduce, you know, um, build and sustain that competency in your board of commitment and understanding. And, and that's a real challenge, and, and I don't want to minimize that. And I think as an industry, giving tools that make it easier for the, the CEO, CQO, CMOs to, you know, use those existing tools to quickly get their boards up to speed in terms of knowledge and commitment is a is a really important thing that we've been working towards and I'll I'll make sure to highlight and and lead you to where you can get those those usable tools. If we want to move forward. So the other components of variation in boards quality work are really this guidance and standard of work. So this variable guidance if you go to you know, the AHA's conference or your state hospital association conference, or uh, if you go to the governance institute conference, you know, this variable guidance was a very big challenge in what hospital boards should know and what activities they should do. Um, and, and I mentioned earlier, this sort of revolving panel lack of standard curriculum was a, a really, you know, big challenge that um, that the Lucian Leap Institute identified as a, a, a serious pain point causing this variation. So this education content, you know, prior to about 2015 was really focused on motivating your boards, like ask good questions, be committed to quality. But most boards had kind of, you know, really moved beyond that and said, well, we're asking questions, but I'm not sure if we're doing the right set of activities. So moving from sort of this, this idea of like motivation versus how do we know that we're doing the right set of activities was a really um, thing, important thing. And a lot of boards talked about their anxiety that, that they were being managed and the data or quality work shown to them was sort of cherry picked to 
move things along in the board meeting and not have a deeper discussion that that they would rather have that deeper discussion. Okay, if we move forward, the other thing causing the variance was just, you know, the assessment gaps, the, the really, um, we're not assessment tools to evaluate the, the, the work that you were doing versus your motivation. There were assessment tools uh, that oriented towards, you know, does our board ask hard questions and are they motivated? But they, they can be motivated and not still not sure if their, their oversight is covering the right areas. So, um, in addition, the QAPI guidance um, really was being variably deployed uh, and, and the lack of uh, financial consequences and quality contributed to boards saying, okay, well, this doesn't really move the needle on our, our end of day financials. So is it something that should be at the board level? Those, those have been some consistent challenges in, you know, both the motivation and variation in what boards are, are doing. So now that we got that, that like set of challenges off our plate, how, what do we do about them? Let's move forward. Um, one thing that that we we noticed in our uh, IHI work for, and, and this work took about two years, um, and uh, it was a very large effort by IHI and the Lucian Leap Institute, involving all the leading governance organizations, contributing towards thought leadership to come together and provide single guidance on uh, best standards for what boards should be doing. And one thing we all observed based on the, the Ashish Jha's uh, work in that was published in the 2010 health affairs was that boards that are committed to quality, they are higher performing on the quality metrics. So I think using this slide uh, or something like this is really helpful because in your boardroom, when you're educating your board, you know, it's, it's you know, part of what they're looking for is is, is this meaningful to the outcome and performance of the organization? And what this, this research taught us was that, you know, there is a correlation before, between boards that spend time and prioritize quality with a correlation of higher performance on quality outcomes. So board prioritization of quality oversight does matter in terms of hospital quality performance. I want to move forward. So, you know, I, I would be remiss if I didn't, since this is a CMS call, to talk about the CMS guidance for boards. If you're looking for more and more motivation uh, to to get your board reengaged in quality, you know, we have this this notion of quality matters in our performance and board engagement in quality matters, and we also have this um, new revised CMS guidance, which is a great opportunity for you to go back to your board, say there's new revised guidance, want to make sure that we're we're meeting that when the accreditors come through and we're meeting that in, in terms of our, our ethos and commitment to our organization um, mission. And so, you know, you all have access to the, I'm not going to read the CMS original guidance, but on March 9th of 2023, that guidance was updated. So if you want to move forward. And the updates included a little more um, detail around what board's responsibility is. It, it, they're, they're not so generic as check the box, put it in the minute, the minutes that it would that the board approved this. Um, there was a, there's more detail in this new guidance, really outlining that it's not just the board's responsibility, but to to um, look at your quality performance but to oversee that, that the organization is doing something about it. So this guidance made this link between seeing the data, check we saw the data, and, and putting that in the minutes, which is what too many boards were doing, and saying, no, the board's responsibility is to really have a thoughtful discussion with the leadership team of how do you use and aggregate all this information, all this data, all your, your quality performance data in, in terms of, you know, setting your improvement objectives and making sure that the board's responsibility is to make sure that the, those improve that improvement work is resourced. So, you know, making this link between, yes, our board looks at quality and maybe has a quality committee, maybe doesn't, um, but our board, you know, prioritizes quality to our board actually understands how we're improving. And that's the real big jump that, that I see in this interpretive guidance. Um, you know, the board also 
is asked to understand how those priorities are established, data is collected and organized and used to monitor to improve quality and safety. And this doesn't mean that the, the board has to do the, the you know, the board should not be doing management's job. There's a reason you have specialized people doing this work is that the board understands that they're having that conversation with management of, you know, how do you know that you're collecting all the right information? You know, what don't you know about what's surprising you and, and how do you then adjust the information that you're collecting or the training that you're doing and make those adjustments so that you capture that and improve on that. And, and you know, you don't want to be having your QAPI work, you know, set towards a small piece of, of your organization when there's other harm hap happening in other areas that you're just not capturing. So I think it's more getting the board to have have that sort of interactive, thoughtful discussion about data collection, gathering from all different sources, ensuring that you have a common definition of harm and uh, psychological safety to report harm, and that the board is supportive of how the management sets the QAPI priorities and ensures that they're resourced and uh, committed to by the leadership. Um, in the interpretive guidance, they also ask that the board have evidence of having an active role in oversight at all locations of care. Um, I think that this speaks to the fact that a lot of the quality work of boards has been very hospital centric. And as we move care out of the hospital, as we um, move it to other locations of care, ensuring that the board um, works with management to uh, make sure that management's looking at its quality operations in all the places of care. And then the board's tracking of adverse events and uh, types of errors is one responsibility that was delineated in this interpretive guidance. Um, and lastly, just this, they added this piece about contract employees um, and, and ensuring that they also have QAPI efforts. And, um, and that's a, the, those are the three, the five pieces. I think really that when you look at the broader interpretive guidance update, those are the areas. All right, if we wanna move forward. Okay, and so the joint commission, um, it really has not updated its, its guidance um, since the uh, CMS guidance has been updated, but we all expect that to be coming out soon. So move forward. And then all we have all this other quality feedback for boards. So how do you figure out what to show your board uh, that's external and what to show your board that's internal that you're tracking? So let's talk about a framework for that. Move forward. So, you know, if you if you sort of sit in the board seat, there's a lot of noise on data and guidance. There's not enough time for discussion, and there was just too much variance. And I I really think that um, boards care deeply if they're taking their time, for the most part, in nonprofit health health systems. Uh, but also even in the for-profit health systems, they're choosing to do that, um, that work as a board member, and it's not an insignificant commitment because they really care about their communities and the health of the communities. But the complexity of quality oversight um, is challenging. And so I think really getting to the point of a, a clear roadmap and consistent guidance for boards was something that that was a, is, was a huge priority um, for IHI and for um, you know, all the other healthcare uh, guidance organizations. So let's move forward to what that looks like. Okay, so, so what does that look like? Let's talk about the workflow and attributes of a board committed to quality. Move forward. So the resource that we spent about two years producing uh, in conjunction with all the leading uh, governance organizations is this framework for governance of health system quality. Um, I, I would encourage you to, to go to IHI's website, or if you want, you can email me personally and I'll, I'll send you a PDF of it. Um, because it's, it was really the, the sort of seminal work that was created to move from motivation to a standard of work of, of what boards should be doing versus, you know, generally uh, telling them to ask good questions. And, and I think that specific guidance on standard of work is really important. Um, 
and it's a very collaborative effort that that um, that was put forth. Uh, we talked to almost all the different state hospital associations of what they were doing. We talked to uh, IHI, uh, AHA, Governance Institute, and and really pulled together you know all the thought leaders to say what's what, where could we all meet in in establishing what best in class boards are doing and share that that widely. Move forward, please. So what we did is use a design thinking approach for this is we said, you know, let's not start with what we, the CMOs and CQOs want the boards to do, right? What we, the CEO wants the board to do. Let's start with, you know, in an end state design thinking methodology, what does a, a really effective board look like? And, and if, if we walked into the boardroom, what would we want the board member to say? And there were three, you know, fundamental things that, that after sort of, muddling through talking to all these different top boards uh, that are really committed to quality that, that sort of emerged as three uh, core components. The boards committed to quality, the board member would say, I understand the domains and sort of key areas of quality. And then the board member would say, I also understand our process internally to assess and prioritize and improve care. And this really kind of connects with that CMS interpretive guidance that it's not just about like, here are the buckets of quality, the IOM dimensions, right? This is, it's not about just saying, we know what those dimensions are steep. You know, it's, it's about, you know, saying, we understand how our system translates that into improvement work within the constructs of all the, the areas where we provide care. And then the third piece is saying that our board culture shows commitment to delivering quality for all patients. So there's a culture piece, there's a how we translate that into our, our processes, and then there's a piece that's understanding the, the, the domains of quality. So that's the end state of where we wanted to get. Let's move forward in how we get there. So the framework for governance of quality is really about, you know, what do we need to get to the right hand side, that vision for effective board governance of quality. And we need some core board processes. What should we do? And we need core board knowledge areas. And those knowledge areas come in three big buckets, core quality knowledge, core system improvement knowledge, and the board culture and commitment. But the core board processes is really translating that knowledge in what should our board do? And there's obviously gonna be some variation, you know, if you have a single standalone safety net hospital versus if you have a rural access hospital versus if you have um, a health system that, you know, is very large and has 100 clinics and, um, and nursing homes. So the way you interpret these processes will vary based on the type of your system, but there are some core activities that your board should do no matter what the, the type of system that you have it looks like. So that's called the governance of quality assessment. So in order to get to that vision of, of effective governance of quality, there are some key activities you should do, which are your core board processes, and there are some key knowledge areas that your board should, should have a basic understanding of. So let's move forward from here. So just, I'm, I'm not gonna go through all of the areas because it would, would take us a little bit too much time, but I, I wanna share the resource with you of how this governance of quality assessment, it's a simple survey that um, allows you to assess your activities, not your general motivation, but your actual activities um, and, and you know understand where you might have gaps. And this isn't used, I don't recommend this be used as a sort of gotcha for the board to come at the health system and say, we're not doing this, but as a, a framework for discussion of what should we add to the agenda? What should we take off the agenda? How should we change our on-ramping of new board members to make sure we're all understanding the board's role and understanding the core quality concepts and the board's role in supporting those? So it's it's not, it's it's used to, evaluate your board workflow and improve it in a collaborative way. So the first category is this board culture and commitment. You know, is it on the maiden board agenda? Are you spending time on it equivalent to time on finance, um, time on quality, 
and having that be not on consent agenda every time reflects board commitment. Um, does your board have in depth and initial initial in depth edu education on quality and improvement for all trustees? And do they offer ongoing quality experiences and sometimes even mini quality sessions? Like you can offer a half hour, you know, quality experience to the board that, you know, before the board meeting, or you can offer it, you know, a walkthrough of quality in a particular location of care, you know, quality in the NICU or quality um, in our clinic. Uh, how, how would you look at that in different environments of care? Um, so, making sure the board understands that in their ed initial and ongoing education. The, this is a big one that is a, is a tough point for boards. A lot of times you get this data dump uh, if you're on the board of, of information and you get it like the night before or even the day of the meeting. And it's really hard to be a thoughtful uh, contributor to a board meeting if you're not getting that information at least four or five days in advance where you have time to read it, digest it, and, and prompt yourself with questions. Um, so it's really hard if you're just getting that consent agenda that's 50 pages in the board meeting and, and you haven't gotten it in advance. It's, it's hard to be thoughtful and, and uh, interactive. And that's too often a fault of uh, the, the process that the way those board packets are put together. And it's a big detriment to having a board that's supportive and contributing on quality. Um, another thing is that the board's reviewing the annual quality and safety plan performance on metrics and involved in setting the quality aims, not involved in, in sort of setting those aims, but really understanding and supporting management of how did you set those aims and how are you going to track progress against those main aims? Because it's really the leadership team's job to execute that operationally. But the board needs to be involved to say, we understand and support what you're doing. And, you know, we want to make sure it's well resourced that that it's something that um, you uh, know that you have the resources for, because a lot of times there's this gap of, you know, you, here's the data on our performance, but you can't get better if, if you don't have the resources for it. And, and if the board isn't setting it a priority, um, and linking that to the leadership team's performance, then you're very unlikely to get it resourced. Um, that kind of leads right into the next one, which is tying leadership performance incentives, some portion of them to performance on some quality dimensions or quality improvement um, efforts. And then really getting the board occasionally out to the point of care uh, in, in the health system, and you don't have to take the whole board to one point of care. I usually recommend that, that you have sort of board members go out to different points of care and then have a, you know, 15 minute reporting of what did you learn about that point of care and how they view quality at that point of care or how they assess quality at that point of care. So that the board feels like they're, you know, involved to, to sort of contribute that uh, thought partnership back. Um, and last, you know, really asking your board, are they asking questions about gaps, trends, and priority issues and actively engaged in that discussion? So those are the core questions around a board committed to quality. If you wanna move forward. Um, the white paper has three short guides that make it really helpful uh, and easy to just hand a uh, board member some core knowledge. If you're a system that doesn't have a lot of resources to support your board, you can easily give them that framework for core quality knowledge and system improvement knowledge so that everybody can have uh, a common vernacular that they're using if you want to move forward. Um, so the GQA, it's, it has these six categories. I talked about the first category, which is board culture and commitment. Um, it, it's a snapshot of where your board stands in their uh, work on quality and their elevation of their standard work. It's not an overwhelming survey. It's only 30 questions. It takes under 10 minutes to do. There are a lot of other surveys for boards out there. Um, in fact, I have a folder that's probably like this big of all the surveys. And I think that's one of the challenges is, you know, it's, it's easy to 
you know, throw a lot of these surveys at boards, but not all of them actually lead you to, are we doing the right set of work? So the orientation of this work was really, uh, how do we create a standard work for boards? And if you wanna do above and beyond more than that, great. But if you think about the context of the time that boards have together, and I was just looking um, recently at the, the AHA's uh, annual governance survey, and most boards effectively spend about 20 hours a year and you know, to cover all the multitude of issues. So we have to be really efficient with the time that we use and, and their, their focus on quality. And, and in that AHA survey, they, they basically said that you know, boards don't intend to spend more time. There's only so much you can get of people. So you know, one of the, the things to think about is, you know, are we using our time effectively? And this GQA tool, of these 30 questions is really a different type of assessment because it, it gets to the core of what the board's doing, not its intention, not its motivation, uh, not do we care about patients. It's, it's actually looking not at effort, but at your core quality oversight processes. It also covers the continuum of care going beyond the hospital and incorporates the, um, all the quality dimensions. Um, and, and, and just emphasizing that it was built very collaboratively with all the leading governance organizations. So I put the link there. I'm happy to you know, send, it, send you a PDF uh, way to do it um, in, your, in your board just to say, what are we missing or what are we not covering that we, we need to cover? Move forward, please. So the next area that the GQA covers besides the culture and commitment is safety. Um, and you know, there's been, I, I was just rereading the, the uh, New England Journal of Medicine catalyst piece of, you know, everyone, all these healthcare leaders debating why um, safety has struggled post pandemic and through the pandemic um, and very differing perspectives. Um, but I think getting back to what does a board that's committed to safety actually do? It's these six things. And, and so, you know, not, not focusing on, you know, commitment here, but really focusing on the activities of oversight. You know, a board that's committed to safety is actually tracking the performance on over time for both in hospital and other settings of care for safety metrics. So we have, you know, a lot of boards that get hit with, here's this data and then it goes into this what i call like the data black hole we never see it again and what boards should be doing really is is tracking variation and trends over time and that's the responsibility of leadership to help connect those dots between here's what that data tells us here's how we trend it over time or here's how the variation within our system looks here's the high performer here's the low performer and here's what we're doing uh, as a leadership team for our QAPI to bring the low performers up to the high performer or to reduce the variation in our system. But, but if boards are seeing a piece of data and then it goes poof into the black hole and you never see it again, it's really hard to be engaged and discuss that performance and trend over time with the leadership team if you feel like that, I call it data anxiety of like, will I ever see this again? Does it matter? So, you know, getting to the point where you, know, you, you have an annual um, snapshot for the board of here's all the important buckets of, of information that we're going to show you. And we're going to show you this consistently year over year because we want to be tracking our improvement towards it year over year. And then there's some things that might be a unique improvement effort that pop up, right? This is a, a, a problem that we didn't know we had, a bunch of claims came in, a bunch of incident reports came in or patient grievances came in, and here's how we integrate those you know, additional QAPI work streams into the board oversight. So really thinking about what do we need to track over time and, and how do we remove some of that data anxiety from the board? so that they feel like they're seeing things consistently and thoughtfully in a way that's not just aggregated. Here's our average across 11 hospitals. Well, it's much more meaningful to say, here's the average, but here's the variation and, and here's how we're calibrating across our hospitals or health system. Um, annually, this isn't one that's often a struggle 
is how do we make this financially meaningful? And I think most boards really don't have an understanding of the quality and safety costs has a financial cost. And, and I think the link to the CQO and CMO over to the CFO is, is often not well made. So I think spending some time on, you know, what is the financial impact on quality in terms of payments, in terms of liability costs, and what are we spending to improve quality in terms of training, in terms of our system investments in specific uh, technologies um, and, and areas of training to improve quality so that you actually get a financial picture of the cost of quality. It'll, it'll be much more motivating to the board to understand that, that this is meaningful in terms of our ultimate mission, but also financially relevant. Um, and, and that's a challenge for many boards. Um, the board's uh, understanding of incident reporting trends and timeliness. I had a conversation a couple of weeks ago with a large health system CEO, and I asked, uh, what percentage of your claims do you know about within 24 to 48 hours of the event? And um, this individual wasn't sure, called me back two days later, and was shocked that it was 37%. So just in terms of the the connecting that uh, incident reporting timeliness to the ability to react and improve on those issues is a, is a really important thing. So that the board doesn't need to be looking at every incident and way in the weeds, but, but connecting those dots between, you know, we're getting things reported in a timely fashion because we have psychological safety and then when they're reported, we have a process that the leadership team identifies how to prioritize and what to work towards improvement. Um, you know, and that's getting to the uh, board's review of serious safety events, uh, ensuring that the leadership team has a process to share findings and improvements, not necessarily share that with the board always, because you can have a very large health system and there's no way you can share all of those, but the board has comfort that they have a process to identify prioritize and improve and work on that learning and improvement. Um, lastly, I referred to this earlier, the culture of safety survey, um, emphasizing the psychological safety, teamwork and workforce engagement. And then the last piece that the board's standard of work in terms of oversight of safety needs to cover the, the basic regulatory compliance survey results and recommendations for improvement. So using this just as a framework, like these are six things that every board, you, your board might do extra, but every board should do these six minimum things in some capacity. The larger your system, you're gonna do it very differently than a single standalone system. But having that discussion of, are we doing these six things is really important. All right, if you wanna move forward. Um, then we, we talked about earlier, the Net Safer Together National Action Plan that has 17 high level recommendations in four areas. Um, it's a good sort of broad tool to sort of jumpstart your commitment to quality. Um, the IHI framework for governance of quality is really more a very tactical tool set up to support the standard of work for boards in the different dimensions of quality. So I think they complement each other fairly well. The safer together is, is a like broader paintbrush and the IHI tool is, okay, let's get tactical and figure out exactly where and how we need to improve and support our board. I'm gonna move forward. Okay, the HA, I just wanna highlight some other great resources that are out there. Um, the AHA has a trustee insights newsletter um, and some uh, board diagnostic that's focused on board behaviors and commitments that Jim Conway, um, the late Jim Conway developed. Um, it ha also has some areas on articles of interest on quality and safety, and they have an ex excellent video that I wanted to highlight. A lot of boards have trouble understanding the credentialing process, um, and there's a video on that um, that uh, Jamie Orlikoff did on the credentialing, role of credentialing. So sometimes those are good things to link into your board portal as additional resources. So if you wanna move forward. Um, also, many of the state hospital associations, when, when we did the IHI um, framework, uh, for governance of health system quality work. We looked at all the states and what each state had. 
and you know, huge variations. Some states have very little to support boards and they were really directing them to places like AHA or Governance Institute or IHI. And some states had very, very developed trustee education and support programs. So depending on what state you're in, you, you may or may not um, have resources through your state hospital association, um, but there are additional good resources out, out there. Um, some of which involve mem paid membership, but many of them are free. We want to move forward. Um, and then uh, I, we did six videos. Um, if you're looking to how do I orient my board to these areas of oversight, um, the Center for Healthcare Narratives at MedStar uh, worked with me to create six videos that are totally free that are about five minutes each. So if you were trying to teach your board about safe care, safety of care. These are all created from a board's perspective, not from, you know, a clinician perspective. So they're oriented towards what should the board member do or what will they experience um, and, and kind of highlight that, that concept area. So they're a great way to sort of show the video, do a little bit of education, and then um, kind of set the standard of work that your board should be doing to oversight, oversee that area. So I wanna make sure that that link is there. Move forward. So the last piece, um, and, and I only went over two of the areas in the governance of quality assessment. Um, and, and so there are specific board activities for each of those areas um, for a board committed to quality. I just went over the commitment and the safety. There are additional uh, areas that, that are very delineated on what the board should do. So let's talk about, you know, how you transition from, okay, this is what we should do uh, and, and what we want to be doing to how do we actually have the right set of tools to get our board there? Because most of the people on this call are um, C-suite leadership uh, at health systems trying to figure out how to pull in your board and commitment, how to support your board in oversight. Um, and also in some of the cases, you know, give your board comfort and, and some of them are too in the weeds. Um, so, so getting that, that calibration of this is the right set of activities for your board. This is the recommendation for standard of work is very helpful to you to give a board reassurance of, look, we're, we're doing this. And it gives the board comfort that this is the recommendation for what they should be doing. And you are able to say, we're doing this and here's our agenda and how we actually do that. So let's go into some of those sort of tactical tools of if you're the CMO, CQO of tactically what you can do to give that board comfort or to reframe the workflow. I'm going to move forward. Um, well, this is a, a common uh, thing I like to talk about. John Wooden, the great UCLA basketball coach, always said never mistake activity for achievement. And I think this is important because in the boardroom, the, the agendas are always packed. Everybody is is super busy um, and there's usually too much uh, what I would say busy activity and not enough stepping back and saying, are we achieving the big dots? Um, so I would encourage you to, to think about this in the context of what you're struggling with on your board and reevaluate your approach to quality oversight on your board is your challenge that they don't really understand. And, and so then maybe you invest a little more in quality education. Is your challenge more that the workflow, like we're not sure if we're doing the right core activities. And then the answer to that one might be that you take an assessment and you use that to realign or, or readjust the workflow. Um, is your issue really the time on quality? And then it's a, a sort of macro issue of, you know, what are we spending time on on our board that we can take off because it's too in the weeds or we're spending so much time on margin because those concepts of days cash receivable are comfortable for boards and we're not spending enough time on, you know, some of the quality metrics that are maybe less comfortable because they don't understand it, but really important to our care delivery. Um, and then really looking at what proportion of your time you're spending on in your board uh, in terms of consent agenda versus discussion. And then the last piece I would ask you to reevaluate is reevaluating this link between quality and 
what I would say is, you know, the, the quality performance, just we're seeing that data versus the board really understanding how you integrate that information and establish your improvement work, you know, and, and, and really do they understand your QAPI? Okay, move forward, please. Um, in terms of renewing the education, uh, evaluating the board quality knowledge training, bringing, I talked earlier about bringing the board to the front line, uh, providing these mini quality and patient centered experiences or requiring a board to join the quality committee if you have one um, as they sort of center their work on the board, understanding the core of your operations. Move forward. Um, if you wanna do one more click, yeah. So a lot of times boards feel like the, this is the kitchen drunk drawer. Luckily it's not mine. Mine doesn't quite look like the one on the right, but it doesn't look like the one on the left. And and I think really reevaluating boards fee a lot of times feel like they don't know what's coming and they, you know, it's it's like a surprise what's on the agenda all the time. So I think getting to the point where you give an annual agenda for what the board annually needs to cover on quality and how you're gonna do that throughout the year, it removes some of that anxiety of like what are we what's being thrown at us. Um, that's very helpful for boards not putting on the consent agenda. We talked about that. And then really starting your board with quality, not ending with it. I see too often that that we talk first about finance and then the board's time on quality inevitably runs over and we don't you know, spend enough time saying, are we delivering good care and what does that look like? And what are the drivers of that? So starting with quality, not ending with that. And maybe you can't get your board to do that at every meeting, but if you at least commit to two of your four meetings a year or three of your six meetings, whatever, 50% of your meetings that you're gonna start with quality, not end with it, um, I think is a, a very big commitment to how you evaluate your organization of your workflow and your time commitment towards that workflow. Um, I also really love the idea of quality mapping, you know, that, that not in a in a, a very high level, giving a visual uh, to the board of here's the different areas that we pull quality information in together. Here's how we process that. Here's who owns those pieces of that, and here's what we do with that and how we track it. Because a lot of this isn't you know just having the board evaluate your performance because there's no way they can in 20 hours a year really. Um, do something that that's in depth that is that in depth and operational. This is much more about the board having comfort with the way your leadership team is evaluating quality and the commitment to looking at quality in all the different areas of care and in, and connecting that link to improvement. So I, I think that sort of mapping process is really helpful um, for boards. All right, moving forward, uh, and, and then we'll just kind of wrap this up here. Um, last piece is really helping your boards understand safe care. It's very important to spend some extra time with them on tracking safety culture or helping them understand that concept of psychological safety. Making sure that your board is comfortable with how you act on concerns about safety and how you react to event reports. And in particular, that your board understands this concept of just culture and responsible risk management. So if you move forward, there's two videos on the bottom of that slide that I think are really helpful that I like to use with boards that sort of instantly give them that, that understanding of, oh, that's what that concept is. And, and so then that, and then you can link that with showing them the psychological safety data. Um, and, you know, I, the other thing I think is really helpful, I'm not gonna go into these case studies, is using a case study, whether it's internal in your system or some of the ones that exist externally of, you know, how you uh, show them the continuum of event to reporting, to tracking, to improvement, and really then linking that to the, the proactive, predictive, things that you could have had in place or you put in place. So using these case studies to see that not just as a point in time, but as a continuum of system improvement and learning is, is very helpful with boards. So I would encourage you to, to use a case study either internally or externally. Um, last, last 
uh, slide here. I think we're almost towards the end and then we'll go to switch to discussion in the chat. Okay, so, um, and I talked about this connecting the dots between safety outcome, the financial, and then the improvement. So move one, one forward. Um, I'll just quickly show the other categories of the governance of quality assessment. And one thing that we did um, that was at the request of board members was instead of just using acronyms upon acronyms, here's STEEP, is we talked about it from the lens of the patient. So rather than saying effective care, you know, say, provide me with the right care. And I think just in your own vernacular with the board, you know, pull your, pulling uh, your, your C-suites um, vernacular out of the, the medical acronyms into the lens of what the patient expects us to deliver for them is very helpful to the board members. It's very motivating. Um, on this one, it's, you'll see just the, the elements of clinician credentialing, um, trends and drivers of care, metrics for um, physician staff engagement, so on and so forth. Move forward. Um, we get to the treat me with respect, equitable and patient-centered care, um, trends in patient complaints, interaction with patients or patient stories, um, diversity and inclusion, and the approach to disclosure I talked about earlier, following harm, and then uh, evaluating uh, the care by different patient populations. Move forward. Uh, next is the, the next on the governance of quality assessment in the framework is the help me navigate my care, making sure that the, the board has a discussion with management about how management evaluates timeliness and efficiency of care in their, in their oversight. Move forward. And category six is the community and population health and wellness piece. Um, we talked about the community health needs assessment that's required and how that factors into leadership priorities, performance and risk-based contracts, continuity of care issues, and social determinants of health. Um, move forward. I move forward for this. So just, to, I wanna get to our questions. So this is the last slide and, and um, you know, I, I just would encourage you, there's, there's a lot of resources out there uh, to, to go back and think of where your board is on that continuum from we're not motivated to we're motivated and we, but we don't know what to do, right? Or, you know, we're motivated, we think we know what to do, but we need to reassess and calibrate. And, and to, to look at the solution set, it's kind of like having a, a fishing tackle box, right? What, what do we, what solution set do we need to move our board forward? And I gave a lot of information um, here about different tools you could have in that toolbox that you can use. Um, but the most important, I think, thing to do is to, to have a standard of work uh, and a, a game plan, a, a, a annual game plan for how your board is approaching quality, to not just be throwing information at them, but to be deliberate and thoughtful and prioritizing it in the board meeting. So I'm gonna pause here as I've, I've been seeing out of the corner of my eye, the, the chat filling up and um, I haven't had a chance to read all the chat, uh, but I know that Ron and others have, um, you know, I, I think I would just pause before we go into the chat and say that, you know, the board often is your most underutilized asset in accelerating <laughs> quality because they're the ones that can set it as a greater priority in terms of the leadership team they are the ones that can help you resource and and get support for areas that you want to improve so but but skimming over it and moving it to consent agenda um, that really creates frustration because they want to feel that they're your partner and supporting the health system to which they're devoting a lot of time to get better so you know, what I'd like to do is just to say, like, what else, what, what, do, what are your most important challenges? And let's talk about a few of them. So, Ron, why don't you lead us through the, the chat? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, with uh, uh, your, your consent and, and everybody else's will stay for an extra 15 minutes, if that's okay with you. Um, Jay, that's okay with you. AHRQ, that's okay with you. Nobody's going to cut us off. You, you guys have paid your uh, WebEx bill. 
Um, okay. Well, great. So, so, so thank you so much for that, Alfred. I'm going to let you uh, manage the, um, the, the chat in terms of questions. So please raise your hand um, for questions and, and Alfred will help with that. Uh, I'm going to take the moderator's prerogative and, and take, I thought, thought there were a couple of interesting questions in chat. And I, I thought one of the interesting ones was, um, you know, suppose everybody's listened to your, 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 your wonderful webinar and the board hasn't paid attention um, and something bad has happened. And now how do you, you know, there's that old expression, never let a good, never let a crisis go to waste. Um, yeah. Something terrible has happened at a hospital and God knows there are enough examples of that. How do you, how do you pivot and say, all right, we can do better, you know, with the board? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I do think that's true, never to waste a good crisis. That's an opportunity to, to sort of step back and say, you know, do we need to recalibrate what we're doing? Can we use this assessment of our standard work, which is the GQA, to make sure we're not missing some pieces? And, you know, do we need to have a board quality retreat? Do we need to um, really reevaluate the, the prioritization in our annual board agenda? And those are those are all opportunities that um, whether you have an event or you don't, you can use the CMS guidance, the adjusted guidance as your event right now. You can say, hey, there's new guidance. We just want to have a, a board reset to make sure that we're meeting that standard and, and meeting our patient expectations. Good. Paula, go ahead. I think you're unmuted. I, it looks like I'm still muted. Can I don't know. We're hearing you. No, we're hearing you. Go ahead. We're hearing you. Okay, great, ahead. great. Actually, I would be fascinated to hear the answer to Doug Salvador's question. Um, how how is it possible for the board to resist a narrow focus on a few externally reported measures or incentives that favor investment in certain specific areas and set their own priorities? Yeah, I mean, I. I it's it, that is so alluring, and Doug, I know Doug well, and, and Doug's right. I mean, it's it's easy to do that. Um, it's easy to just focus on you know U.S. News and World Report, or uh, yeah. I, I think I think really um, this is where the management team, the leadership team, has to sit down and say, you know, if we if we take all that noise off, you know, here's how we really ensure that we're delivering quality care to the patient. And, and this is where mapping what that quality oversight integration of that information and, um, and improvement that results that that journey that that quality journey needs to be something that the board understands. And I, I do think that's been kind of the missing piece is a lot of times the board just sees, you know, here's our performance on falls. Here's our performance on central line infections, you know, but that, that doesn't tell the board the bigger picture in, you know, how the organization is um, integrating all the sources of quality and ensuring that that they're addressing the ones that are not just easy to improve, but the, the most important to, to work on. Um, and, and I think that's really like th that sense of quality mapping would be really helpful for that type of an organization. Um, if it's, if it, the board just wants to focus on one metric, then you know maybe you don't have all the right people on the board who really um, want to roll up their sleeves and understand the the complexity of quality. So I think um, at that point, you know, bringing those people to the point of of care and talking about the dimensions of quality in that setting also helps them understand that that complexity. Um, and I do think the case studies help in this regard, uh, rather than just talking about the data point, talking about sort of an example of that that case, that patient flow through that led to to quality issues. Great. Yeah, thank, thank, you. thank you so much. That's really helpful to see that if the executive leadership and the board are explicitly saying to themselves, it's our responsibility to develop our priorities, not to follow what some other entities are saying, there's money if you do this. Yeah. That, and that takes a little bit more board courage. So this is where using a tool that like, like the IHI tool that we created that, that says, this is a standard of work of what boards should be doing, not just, you know, here's how we chase the, the, the star or the rate, the rating. Um, because 
it's it's so simple to do that and manipulate that data. Um, but the, I don't think people are on boards just to say we're a star hospital. You know, they're they're on the board to say, gosh, we really care about our neighbors and our community. And I think centering that board discussion on you know separate from all that that data noise. You know, let's talk about how we as a leadership team integrate that information internally, externally into our improvement work. Thank you. Uh, Crystal Kimbrough. Uh, hold on a second. Yeah. Oh, she went away. Um, oh, oh, you're back. Hold on. That's maybe it's go ahead. Oh, I, may, I may have deleted her. I'm sorry. Crystal, come on back. Um, I'm, I'm new at this. All right. All right. I'm not doing the right thing here. Crystal, I'm sorry. No, um, no, you're you're fine. Are you there? Are you there? Okay, go ahead and talk. Go ahead and start I'm talking. here. Hi, no Crystal. Worries. Hi, hello, everyone. Thank you so very much for this wonderful webinar, and I really I'm going to delve deeper into those uh, resources that you provided. But I like how you really encapsulated the the framework of that effective governance, and you broke it down into those where you said problem, process, and people, and I equated that to three cross uh, cross covering buckets where you know it 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 accomplishes all of those and and it, and given that board the board uh, that that uh, 360 view which helps to remove those biases so the problem helps them look at the big picture of the quality issues and the process with the system and then the people looking at the equity uh, and I, all of the the elements the one important element that when you mentioned how with for the board to go out and actually put feet on the ground, what I like to call that gamble walk, mm -hmm. to really bring the um, the concrete into reality or mm -hmm. the the abstract into reality, you know, because they're far removed. But to really put that, you know, that textual essence to the whole big picture of what's going on in the conference room, you know, and and really bringing it to reality. Because and I and I think it's some in some ways, and I really want to do a deep dive into that the the uh, the governance uh, guidelines because I think of it as a way, an opportunity to kind of change the di the di the uh, the di uh, what's the word I'm looking for the di the well, change the diet the the look <laughs> I don't think of the word I'm looking for but it's just the whole paradigm of it and. You know, with the board being rather than at the top and going down in the triangle. Yeah. With the board being as the base, the foundation yeah. and peaking upward with those upward that upward peak being all of those minute problems that those quality issues that we're trying to eliminate. So yeah, you know, I, think, just, I think Crystal, what you're kind of talking about is um, that that the board sees quality not as something that's programmatic. But that is core to our entire um, operation and existence of delivery of care. And I think this connects a little bit back, Crystal, what you're saying to um, what Anne from Freightart said, which is kind of the the what detail the board level the board gets in, and to Doug's question as well, depends on the type of system you're in. So if you have a standalone system, the board might be in one level of detail. If you're a system board member, you might be focused on a lot more variation across the system and how making sure that you have a common definition of harm and a common way to track harm uh, across the system or a common definition of quality across the system. And maybe you're looking at psychological safety across the system and where the variation is that needs to be closed or uh, you know, cardiac outcomes across the system and where the variation is and what's causing it. So the way you approach some of the components in the framework for quality depends on whether you're a standalone hospital or a broader, more complex system, but those are the core activities that you should be doing. So um, any other additional questions or thoughts? Yeah, yeah. There, there, let, why don't we go on to the next question here? Um, this is, I'm gonna unmute. Uh, C Schaefer, and then I have just one last question at the end, and then we're going to end. Let me let me see if I can if I unmute you. Okay, C Schaefer. Sorry, I don't know your first name. Go ahead. Uh, all right, I thought I unmuted him. Okay, right, go, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, uh, thank you so much for your presentation. I come I come to this um, webinar as a chair of a board, 
and trying to work um, with my board in a little different manner. And and what I my only um, feedback for you is, I um, I have equity on my list. I have population health. I have community outreach, and we do a safety story, which is really a case study. And so, my reflection on what you offered today, which was extremely rich, is that. I just need to recast the elements on my agenda mm -hmm. in the six in the six categories that you described. And I think that's going to be a very, very powerful framework. I've already um, printed your the um, the governance um, document to to really show my board. Look, we're doing a lot of different quality related and patient safety issues. We just haven't put it in the maybe the right context. So. Again, I really appreciate um, the resources you've turned us on to and, and your insights. Really excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I think a lot of that is is what you're talking about is if you're chair of the board, it's it's giving the that annual agenda and that comfort for the board of here's how we put all these pieces of the puzzle together. Here's the roadmap of where we're going. And here's our expectation <laughs> of you as board members to thoughtfully engage, but not you know, interfere with the daily operations of the hospital, but to, to engage in a way that expects uh, thoughtful collaboration and uh, commitment to improvement. Let me let me uh, take the last uh, again, the moderator's project a second time and ask the last question. Um, this came from the chat, um, which was sort of an unanswerable question, perhaps, but what are, what are the characteristics you look for in board members who are going to bring this quality focus to the board if you're if you're pick, if you're picking board members what are you looking for yeah i mean you know, so running the governance nominating process for a board is is really complex because you can't if you stack the board with all people that are our systems engineers and understand hro you know, then you're going to have no one that can look at your, you know, so sort of cash management and and some of the, those things. So, you know, building a, a board, especially um, as we have boards that are are smaller and really act more active and not foundation boards, um, building that the fabric of that board uh, is important to have people with all different talents. Um, I would be remiss to say if I didn't think that every board needs someone with a you know, HRO um, mindset or a, a systems improvement mindset. Um, but I also think it's the responsibility of the whole board, of the fiduciary responsibility of the whole board as an entity to say, this is not just that person's job because they come from Toyota and they understand HRO. This is all of our responsibility, even if you're a lawyer. Um, or your, you know, a community philanthropist that all of us have to understand the essential role and, and components of that role that quality um, plays in delivering patient care. And if if we're not talking about quality as a board, you're not delivering on the mission. So I, I think centering on, you know, what does it mean to exist as our hospital? What are we trying to do? Um, and is, does our board discussion, our board agenda, our board education reflect that core mission of what we're trying to deliver to our community? Thank so. you so much. Thank you for spending additional 20 minutes with us as a UCLA Bruin for eight years. I'm going to take that John Wooden slide and sh put it up at the beginning of all of my meetings and see if the meetings get any shorter. Um, thank you again for everyone. Thank you for everyone for listening and your great comments and questions. And join us for, for next month's webinar. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Great call, everyone. Thank you, Michelle.